It's time for the moment you've been waiting for. The game we have all been waiting for is finally complete and it's going to be available for preload tomorrow, August 17th on Xbox and August 30th for PC. Meaning you could download the game early to be ready for the game's launch at the end of the month. What a day indeed. Today we got absolutely slammed with Starfield info and as you could tell, I'm buzzing about it. From the Discord Q&A with Will Shen and Emil Pagliarulo to some other Bethesda posts, I will go through all of it here today and give you my thoughts on each subject. So we'll start off with the 16 community questions asked on Bethesda's official Discord page answered by Emil Pagliarulo, longtime Bethesda developer, famous for his quest writing mainly for quest lines such as the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion and as a true Bostonian for inserting his high school Don Bosco tech into Fallout 4 and Will Shen, the lead quest designer for Starfield, famous for leading the quest design on Far Harbor, one of Bethesda's best DLCs ever. A spooky island packed with interesting characters, crazy monsters, and tons of choice and consequence. Some of these questions are kind of gimmies and things I assumed were true, or things we already know, but there are a handful of really good questions that had awesome in-depth answers. There's still a bunch of questions the community would love to know, like can we manually fly around inside each star system? Will there be a survival mode? Are spacewalks a thing? Can we explore underwater? How will trade routes actually work, etc. But we learned a lot today. Let's begin with number one. Can we buy houses or properties in main cities? Boo, bad question, of course we can. They say there is a dwelling we could purchase in every major city in the game and at least one for completing something. Most likely a quest or a quest line. Again, I totally assumed we could do this. I find this kind of redundant. It's Skyrim in space. Of course we get our space Markarth house. Question two, if we get the kid stuff trait, will our parents look like our character? Yes, just like in Fallout 3 with your dad and Fallout 4 with your son, in Starfield, your parents are generated to match the character we create. And Emil says we should really appreciate the actors. They got our parents to play. They get super into their roles and that we could get stuff from the trait. Maybe home cooked food or other gifts. This is a good question and a great answer. Something I was actually curious about from the direct. Question three basically asks, what should a first time BGS player know before playing? How deep should our character's backstory be? They say the games are made for old and new players. Everyone starts off in the same area on Mars. And what happened to you is totally up to you and your head cannon or made up backstory. You could choose traits and a background to match your headcanon, or even pick an anonymous background and no traits if you want. Emil gives an example of headcanon for his latest character. He says, my latest character is a working schlub named Mitch Dombrowski. He's a husky, good-natured space trucker, and he'll do whatever he needs to do to defend himself. He'll never shoot first. He's like Han Solo's sweeter older brother. I really love Emil's answer here. Don't look at it like a game, look at it like a living universe. Settle in, go at your own pace, and pretty soon you'll learn all the systems and be buzzing around the way you want. Basically, don't worry too hard about it if you're brand new to BGS games. Question four, how will smuggling cargo work? Another question that we pretty much knew the answer to with a couple extra interesting tidbits. Yes, we could hide contraband in our shielded capacity slot. We must purchase a special ship module for access to shielded capacity and use it to sneak by security ships in orbit around planets. And Emil ends it with saying, so you know, don't get caught with those harvested organs. What does that mean? And he says there are items other than Aurora with backstories he cannot mention yet. That's pretty cool that there seems to be plenty of contraband to smuggle, maybe even actual harvested organs. <laughs> I don't know how much I enjoy that, but you know, that, that's there. Also, another assumed piece of info tied to the economy. It is a fixed economy, meaning that it will not change with supply and demand, but prices can differ 
with different skills you choose as per usual BGS games. Question five, will there be a jail system for committed crimes? Yes, basically Skyrim's system of go to jail, pay a fine, or resist and attempt escape. Now that isn't very interesting, but if we think a little bit further, it could be very interesting. Can we escape from prison? Will prison make our character lose stats? Will there be brigs on ships? Will there be a giant space station supermax prison? Will there be a quest resembling the movie Lockout? And if you haven't seen that movie, I definitely recommend it. It's a good sci-fi action thriller. Question six, another pooper of a question. Will, <laughs> will time pass when not in game? Will trade routes, outposts, blah, 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 continue to produce when not actively playing? And no, the sim only runs when you are actively playing the game. Question seven, why are you asking questions we already know, but okay. Can you be a double agent in the game, join one faction and infiltrate another? Let's just hear it straight from the developer's mouths about a year ago when they answered this exact question for the first time in the episode two Made for Wanderers video. You know, what we're doing with the, the pirates, the Crimson Fleet as well. They're not just this foe, let the player join them. What does that mean? The cool thing about Crimson Fleet, you know, what if you're a good person and you want to be a good player and you don't want to play as a bad guy, you can side with the pirates or you can report back your superiors and be like basically space cop type of thing. So it lets you be a good person and still play with the bad guys. I think that's really cool too. Emil also makes a comment here that the storyline is based on the movie Donnie Brasco, a true story of an FBI agent who infiltrates the mafia. Now, while I haven't seen this movie, I do really enjoy when these developers inject something, whether it be a story or a visual theme from another source. It gives us a look under the curtain at how these stories in these games can be created and implemented. You could play the game, do the quests, and then go read that book or watch those movies that inspired it and see how they differ and how they are similar. And I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Whether it's Blade Runner, A Boy and His Dog, or a movie like Them. There's so many stories out there that inspire these developers and that in turn inspires me to look deeper or just enjoy those movies on a level I wouldn't without the game. Question eight, is it possible to beat the game as a pacifist? They say it's not totally feasible to complete the game without killing, but there are systems like the dialogue mini game and the use of non-lethal weapons that will aid a pacifist player in most situations. I'm very curious to see what non-lethal options there are. A stun gun? Or does it have something to do with the grab abilities we can access? Number eight, what are the belief systems we could join and their histories? This is a very interesting one. They say that all the in real life religions are a part of the universe, but none of them are focused on. They highlight three new ones specific to the game. First, we have the Sanctum Universum, which is only a couple decades old, but gains a lot of prominence. They believe that God is out there somewhere in the universe and that humans ability to travel the stars is God's way of saying, I'm out here, come and find me. Next, we have the enlightened who are basically atheists who do not believe in a higher power and instead focus on helping humanity through humanitarian work and outreach programs. I assume anyone working in Constellation is one of these two religions, either searching the universe for artifacts that will bring them closer to God, intelligent aliens, or scientific discoveries that will help humanity. There may even be an undercover Varun agent, who knows? Speaking of, finally and most interestingly, we have the House of Varun. So in game, we aren't completely sure of what the truth is, but the gossip among the guards is that a colony ship sets off for a new world. And along the way, after one of the grab jumps, one of the passengers claims that he spent that time communicating with a celestial entity known as the Great Serpent. What was a few seconds for everyone else was much longer for him. He came back with a mandate, which is basically get on board or be devoured when the Great Serpent encircles the universe. We sometimes fight Varun Zealots in the game, and Emil also says that he digs them so much he even got a tattoo of their logo on his wrist. There's a lot to unpack here with Varun's backstory, but again, they're basically the children of Adam with their wild kooky religion, which could easily be true, and zealots who are an enemy group within their faction. Two really interesting things. First, can we have a space serpent encounter of ourselves during one of our own grab jumps? 
giving us some proof it's all true, equatable to the children of Adam's first quest in Far Harbor? And what is this about the Great Serpent encircling the universe? Is this the doomsday or great calamity we must avoid in the game, stopping the zealots from getting hold of the artifacts which could be used as a catalyst for the end of days? It seems the encircling may be a direct parallel to the Children of Adam's division. A divine prophecy which spells salvation, but only the zealots truly seek to bring it into fruition. Question 10. How many companions in total can we recruit? They answered there are more than 20 total all of them with backgrounds and can carry your stuff, with four from Constellation having the most story and interaction with the player. It seems that some also tie directly into the main quest and have some really big moments. There are also generic crew members you could hire to work at Outpost and aboard your ship. You can even ask them to follow you around like previous games. This is about double the named companions in Fallout 4. Question 11. When we assign a crew member for work at Outpost, do we have to pay them salaries? The answer here is no, it's just a one-time payment. With so much to do in the game, they wanted to minimize the amount of things we had to constantly keep track of. You could also negotiate over their payment with the speech minigame. I like this idea a lot. I usually play high charisma and intelligence builds in BGS game, so this will be really satisfying getting a low price to hire. Question 12, will our companions be able to level up their skills? How will they stack with ours? So all crewmates have static skills which will come at different ranks per person. They do stack with your skills when relevant. Some skills are there to highlight their background, while ship and combat related ones can make a larger impact on the game. For example, Sam Coe's rifleman skill will keep you much safer, and Sarah Morgan's astrodynamics expert skill will add range to your gravity drive jumps. I really like the idea of companion skills and them combining with our own. Having the perfect crew build should feel really satisfying. Question 13. What's your favorite part of the game? Which they answer, shipping it. Which, that's pretty reasonable, right? And then Will answers, finding content that he hasn't seen yet for the game. It's so large that no person is likely to have seen it all. And then Emil responds saying that he's basically seen it all and that he has a soft spot for Neon for how much work that went into it to get it nailed down. And it is finally the cyberpunk settlement they always hoped it could be. He also goes on to say that he loves all the quest lines and he thinks that they're the best BGS has ever made. And if that's accurate, we are truly in for it. Question 14, what book or movies had a big influence on some of the quests? Will responds by saying he's a true history nerd, so he listens to a ton of podcasts like Hardcore History and The History of Rome. He says that while the game is science fiction, looking into the past gives him ideas of how humans will react to certain things like war, famine, technological breakthroughs, and with that info, you can imagine how we'd react to similar circumstances in a fictional setting. He also says that he was a big fan of Greek and Norse mythology as a kid since the stories are very big and the characters are flawed with clear motivations. I really love Will's take on history. Using it as a catalog of how humans deal with different circumstances gives him a ton of different options when it comes to writing that will make it truly feel interesting and give it the sense of realism no matter what the context. Emil, on the other hand, rattles off an absolute ton of references. From Star Wars and Interstellar to The Expanse, he mentioned so many that I'm just going to put a picture of his chat on screen here for anyone that's super interested. I know that I'm watching Ice Pirates tonight when I'm done editing this video. In all of Emil's examples, he realizes that space is two things. One, a source of mystery and wonder. And two, a giant blank page on which you could write any story and that they've written a lot of very different stories in Starfield. This is so great to hear. Fallout was always similar in the fact that you could inject almost any story into their universe, but having an actual universe as your canvas, you could really paint anything in it. Question 15. What are some of the small details in Starfield that add to the immersion? They respond by saying the NASA punk aesthetic lends well to the fact that it's a lived-in universe. It's the dishes in the sink, the books on the counter, the notes on the bulletin boards, all of the different environmental storytelling that BGS is truly known for. One thing Will Shen mentions, which has me a little bit confused, is that he says that the patches on companions' clothing are tied to their skills. 
Well, if that's true, then why don't Barrett's patches seem to match with any of his skills? I'm sure we'll find that out at some point. And last but certainly not least, question 16. What is the history and status of the mechs? Emil answers by saying that the mechs are left over from the colony war. Both sides had them, and the Freestar Collective mastered them. The United Colonies had mechs, but they also relied on the controlled alien beasts from their Xeno Warfare Division. Both of those were outlawed in the armistice that ended the colony war. There is also a mech battleground out there somewhere, and no mechs are usable for the player character. They're all in ruins somewhere. But this all leads me to an interesting thought for a questline that may be in the game. We have alien mind control, good enough to where there were entire divisions in the last great war. We have genetically modified and lab-grown monsters, aka the Crete monster. We have an arguably evil pirate faction scouring the Crete lab in the Crimson Fleet. And finally, we have a shot of the Crete monster attacking United Colony security guards most likely on a new Atlantis landing pad. It seems as though we could put the pieces together that the Crimson Fleet could learn to grow, control, and finally use the Crete monsters to assault the United Colonies. Whether it is with a full-scale invasion or just implanting them here and there in the UC territories so that they focus their attention away from the fleet, this seems pretty plausible and awesome to me. What do you guys think? Am I stretching it on that one? And what do you guys think overall of the news? Do you have a favorite question or an unanswered question? Please let me know down below. And I hope all of you found this informative and or enjoyable. Please consider liking the video and subscribing for more Starfield content from me, Duke. The support from you guys has been nothing but amazing. So amazing, in fact, that I actually just got accepted as a YouTube partner. So you can now become a member to the channel and give Super Chats. I cannot thank you guys enough, seriously. And with that out of the way, I appreciate each and every single one of you and hope to see you guys next time. Later.